Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for showing up this evening. Yeah. Uh, with the, as you can tell, it's not going to be by F-16. This is the B-17, and Greg, known as Greg of the B-17. I'm going to try his name, but I'll probably screw it up. It, it's uh, Stephanos. Stephanos. I'm uh, pretty close. That was close. <laughs> not bad for all Scotsmen. Uh, anyway, before I, we get into the, the talk for the evening, I'd just like to remind you that we have these forms at the back end. If you've never filled them in, we'd appreciate if you uh, put in your email address so we can contact you. The contact we had in uh, the newspaper sort of faded away, so we have to rely on getting your back end information. And this will be the last one for the summer because our holidays are coming up and vacations and so on. And we sort of shut down until probably September when we start up again for next year. So without any more ado, we'll uh, turn it over to Greg and uh, launch you off into the wild blue yonder in Thanks, 17. <laughs> <laughs> so when uh, they came, Jeff came to me, and uh, I'm at the museum a lot playing and having fun. This isn't work by any means. Um, they asked if I'd do something on preservation. Um, because there's a difference, in my mind, a difference between preservation and restoration. Restoration is going to do something some way, someday. Preservation, such as we did with Starduster, is she just needs to look good. Uh, so when we're doing a documentary and how it all started is we were, I was doing some filming and we were standing kind of in the front and we were looking at playback and I'm like, this is a combat veteran and it's not even the right color. So how do you tell the story and try to be historically accurate and gain credibility when you're in front of a plane that's not even the right color? So when I went to Jeff, I said, hey, let me adopt it and we'll uh, put it back to its color. Uh, first question, what's going to cost me? <laughs> and uh, I said, nothing, I'll, I'll get donations and we'll, well, I'll get it done. And I have uh, contacts with Home Depot, so I wasn't worried about where the materials would come from or and or the labor. And he said, oh, okay, but you know, still that look like, how many times have I heard this before? And how many people come in and uh, start something and walk away and then it costs us money, we gotta go back and finish it. So uh, when we did this one, uh, this is how Starduster actually sat. And a couple things other than the color were, uh, were inaccurate. Um, the tail number was too high um, for one, and it wasn't yellow. Uh, the actual Starduster is its true combat name from when it was General Ira Aker's personal transport plane with the Mediterranean Allied Air Force. Um, but the little uh, guy that is up here is backwards. Uh, from the original photos, he was backwards. So they made one stencil and they just flipped sides. Um, so when we did it, we actually reversed it based by photos and put it the right way. And then underneath where uh, it says the Mediterranean Allied Air Force, the MAAF, there was a circle with, looked like a line through it. But it was a 1946, 45, 40, 44, 45 photo. We couldn't see it. Every time you enlarge it, pixelated, you couldn't see what it was. Uh, and purely by chance, we found a straight on shot that was clear and it was a circle with a one. That's all it was. Um, so we were able to put that back on to its original. Um, it didn't have hubs on it when uh, it was General Ira Aker's plane. Um, but we can't say for sure that it, that it did or did not. There's no photo of the actual wheels of the side to actually get it. So when we started, we went and power washed it. And um, well, we chose to preserve it uh, because since it's been here since uh, January 10th, 1981, it's been painted five or six times. And every time it was painted, it was sanded. So those rivets weren't uh, sticking out too far anymore. So I decided to power wash it and preserve the structure of the aircraft versus going and sanding the rivets down. Plus it was hot and the water was uh, pretty refreshing. So it took 130 hours to get off all the paint and any of the paint that stayed on, it wouldn't come off. So I figured it's got a good bond, no sense in uh, taking it off. So when we did this, yeah, 130 hours, and then uh, we actually went and taped all the windows and we primered it. So we sprayed the primer, and then uh, a couple days later, Home Depot came out and 
in two days, uh, they put two coats on each side. So they did it between two different work groups. One side they did two coats, next day they came out, did two coats. And they were done even before the barbecue was warm to even cook the hot dogs. <laughs> so um, there were like 30, 30, 35 each time uh, for each day. So the second day we actually had um, a couple of veterans. Uh, Colonel Williams was here who was actually stationed at March Field in April of 40 through August of 41 and flew into Pearl Harbor on December 7th on a B-17, which happened to be the first US piloted plane shot down during the war. So perfect tie-in. We can add him to the March Field. He was here. Uh, he's worked on everything from the YB models to the A all the way up to the G models. So we included him. And this is the only B-17 left, there's 50 left in the world, that was associated with the 15th Air Force. So what we did is I found uh, Archie Aitchinson, who was a radio operator with the 15th Air Force, and we actually interviewed him inside in the radio cockpit. And while we were getting hit the serial number of his plane, it was built 30 before this plane was built from the same factory, uh, it was just 30 digits higher on the serial number. So that was the closest he would ever be to his plane. And the interior is pretty accurate to how it was back in, back in the day. So we did that, and then uh, this is what she looks like today. Wow. So um, we painted, and again, preservation, it's never going to move, it's never going to fly. Uh, so preservation was preserving history on how history was. So we used the aluminum uh, paint, and it was by Rust-Oleum, it's an oil base. And uh, after Home Depot put two coats on, uh, Brian and I put another two coats on. So there's actually four coats of oil-based paint on this plane. So it should last for a very long time, and it should preserve and you know, the integrity of the airplane for it. Uh, all the props, the black, the yellow, everything on there is oil base. Uh, from Rust-Oleum other than the glare shields. Uh, we use marquee on that because uh, it doesn't fade as quick. And uh, again, marquee is a Home Depot product and Home Depot uh, donated the paint, so it made it a whole lot easier to choose the paint. So as it sits today, with a couple minor things, this is how she would have looked uh, November of 44 through the end of War 45, uh, when General Ira Aker would uh, have her as a transport plane. She got her name Starduster because when every time the general took to the sky he wanted the cleanest, the shiniest plane because it was natural aluminum back in 44. But the metal was so beat we couldn't we couldn't polish it up. Uh, and being an outside, I mean there's there's bondo on the plane so the aluminum was the best way that we could do to preserve the plane. Um, there is a, a Barker lounger, easy boy style chair in the front. Um, which is accurate to this plane because that's where he sat whenever he, he flew. Now we assume it was a leather chair because it was a general and generals have egos and it wouldn't have been a flowery chair. So we went with a, a leather chair from period. Um, so that's still in there. The Norton bomb site is actually right behind the chair. It's still in the plane. Um, and there's talks about putting that and just moving the chair back so there's both. So, um, but this is the first preservation job we did. And we filmed the episode um, and went to History Channel uh, because they wanted to see it, they wanted to carry the show. And because you have to remember Home Depot was out there and those little orange shirts were everywhere painting the plane, they wanted to blur everything that said Home Depot. And they had their logo on the back, but on the top it said, uh, um, we work for veterans or something to that effect. And I thought, all right, they're blurred on every show that you see, it's no big deal, or they put black duct tape on. Interviewed a vice president and a general manager, and they said, we've got to cut that out. Um, I said, well, they, they say they're just glad to help preserve history and you know the men that served and, and all this. They're like, uh-huh, they don't pay us advertising dollars. So they said, if you uh, go ahead and do all those changes, we'll buy the 50-episode series. And it took me about five seconds, I said, uh, no thank you, because it's not about the money. Now Home Depot, uh, my friend who, who works there said between the, what they donated and man hours, 
was better than fifty thousand dollars. And you know that deserves them to wear their shirts and to be on camera Amen. because it's not about the dollars. Uh, so when I went back to my team and my team is four people, me and three others, uh, they were so excited when I said, "Hey, they offer us a deal." They're like, "Okay, great." I said, "But I turned them down. Why? Why?" And I explained, I, it's not about the money. And if that wasn't good for them, you know, I can find somebody else who can shoot a camera or do editing. Um, and after the shock wore off, they kind of agreed. So this was a fun project. Uh, I have a photo, my 17-year-old son's here, but I have a photo of he and my other son, who was 10 at the time in front when it was Kermit the Frog Green with uh, Return to Glory. And then like six years after that, we did another one and just did another one a couple years ago. So I've been around this plane for a long time, so this had to be the first one. And plus, Jeff and everybody was uh, really friendly. And um, on the last day that Home Depot was here, we had veterans having lunch from every theater of operation from World War II to present day, from the South Pacific to the European theater, uh, Indochina, I mean, every theater we had people having lunch together. So it, it, was, uh, it was a fun day. So Home Depot got to actually uh, talk with veterans and Home Depot is very big into veterans. If there's 100 people there and one is a veteran, he's gotta really be horrible not to get that job because they will choose him over everybody because he's a veteran. Um, so I really have respect and that was one of the reasons I said, no, we're not going to do that. So when we finished this and we, and we finished filming this one, um, and I'm the host of it and I hate the camera. Um, that thing stares at you, the zoom, the lens zooms in and you can see every glare on it. Um, so this was fun, but editing is wonderful. They took out all that. They made me do a whole bunch of stuff. But I promised my kids, because I've been doing it for so long, that I would be the host. Um, so we did that one and then we moved up to, um, to Larry, California. There's a B-17 that's been sitting alongside the freeway since 1958. It was flown in there. Uh, the records say that uh, Maurice, General Maurice Preston did not fly it in, but the locals say he's the one that flew it in because he was still working in the Pentagon and he was ordered not to. And it was a big secret on that. But um, we went up there and we met a whole bunch of local people who gave us their version because they were there. Not what the official records say, because nobody wanted to get in trouble. So we went up there and did that one. Um, I met a gentleman um, up there uh, or at uh, Lions Museum. Uh, Joe, he uh, does a detail polishing company, does high-end cars. So they were doing uh, Collins Foundation, they were doing the witchcraft. So I talked to him, I said, hey, do you ever do any of the other plans? He said, yeah. I said, well, I have one in mind. He says, well, if it's the B-17 sitting along the freeway in Tulare, we'll do it. We've never done a B-17. I'm like, perfect. Now, the aluminum looked bronze. It's been sitting out since 58. Um, still natural aluminum. The only thing that they've done, and it's owned by, it, it's under the protection of the AMVATS. Um, so somebody came on and put a triangle K on it for the 379th bomb group. Uh, they end up putting the uh, national insignia on, but they use the, uh, the Air Force insignia with the red stripe. The serial number on the plane still had, had a zero for over 10 years old. And the nose art said Preston's Pride, and it was a 1990s font sticker. Uh, so when I, it took me four meetings with the AMBETS for them to say, sure, you can go ahead and do it because you're not going to charge us anything, and we'll let you do that. So they gave me the keys, and that's the only thing AMBETS ever did for this project. Um, did nothing else. So we went out there and started polishing, and at least 500 times people would come up and say, you know what, as a kid, my dad on the way to Los Angeles would always stop and get a picture of this plaque. Then they put a fence up, you know, 30 years ago, and we haven't been able to get close to it since. So the gates were open, and people still would not go in the gates unless you're like, come in. Come in. Um, so we let people in, and these are some of the locals that we finished the project in three months. We polished it out. Team Shine brought nine people from all over the country. They fly in on their own money. Uh, they buy their own food. They just come out to polish airplanes. 
Uh, so they did all that, and locals started coming out. Uh, these, uh, this is Carl at the far left, um, and Donette and Larry, and Neil's the one bending down. These are local people who just start showing up every day. Uh, we finished a year ago, they're out there every weekend washing the plane and making sure, and they don't just wash it, they wash it, then they towel dry it, so there's no water spots on it. So after a year, it still looks shiny. Some of the black, where the black oil base, it, it just ran a little bit. But because of these uh, three people, these three guys, they just go out there every day. They've gotten stuff donated to help it. Um, so it's, this was an amazing job because the locals came out to preserve their local history. They had no idea why this plane was there or how it even got there. But, um, and it was like that, you can't see the tree through the forest type thing. Now that it was polished, people are uh, actually stopping by. Uh, they raise a couple hundred dollars a week just because they're out there on weekends, people drop money. The plan is once it starts cooling down, the inside's actually gutted. Um, from within a week of it landing in 1950, <coughs> people started stealing stuff. So a local restaurant owner, uh, Perry, towed it to his restaurant, put a fence around it. Now people would stop buying and buy coffee and more food because he had a plane there, but stuff stopped disappearing. Uh, and it took uh, the Air Force 10 years to realize the plane wasn't sitting where they left it. <laughs> so they said, um, it's on private land, it's got to be back on public land, and so we're going to take it. There's a big fight because he's losing money. Um, so in the 10 years it was there, palm trees grew and things grew and they added some more stuff. And they said, well, we're just going to take this back fence down. We're just going to tow it through the field and take it there. He's like, you're not touching my fence. you got to take it out through the driveway. Well, it won't fit. It's not my issue. It's not my plan. <laughs> so at nighttime they came and they put plywood down. They put grease all over it. They put the plane on there and they actually spun it. And then they pushed it through and they spun it back and they towed it. And rumor has it, he sat there and just watched them every single time. Would not let him touch anything of his. Uh, and then they towed it uh, down to where it sits today since 1981. And within a week after they moved it, it was hit by a truck. Ah. Coming off the off ramp, the truck on the pilot side ripped the, uh, from the number one engine out and took the stabilizer off. So they went and fixed it, and uh, the landing gear, everything was all messed up. It was sitting on, on uh, telephone poles, the, uh, or, or railroad tracks. They did kind of a frame, and it was actually sitting on it. The dents are still underneath it. Um, so then they, uh, they fixed it, and about a year later, the truck hit it again. So the pilot's wing uh, actually is one foot higher than the other wing, because it bent the whole frame, and it sits there. So the insurance company came out and said, ooh, that's a World War II airplane. That's going to cost us some money. And the ambed said, eh, give us 20 grand. And they're like, all right. They wrote the check. So their idea of fixing it was, uh, they didn't fix anything. They just put aluminum around all the dents so it looks like it's fixed. Um, and then they put this fence around. So, and it, it sat there in the ambed. They say they took care of the plane. They did absolutely nothing. In 1994, somebody approached the Ambats and said, hey, can we wash the plane, but can we take a souvenir out of the inside? They're like, yeah, at least we don't have to do it. So a group of four guys went in there, and they gutted the entire plane. They took every, they took the control panel, the, the seats, the chairs, the yokes, uh, everything. They didn't unscrew anything. They just cut wherever it was easy to access it. And they uh, hosed the plane down, they wiped it down, and they left. So uh, people came, they stole gas caps, whatever could be removed, they took. Now, once people started seeing that we were here, I started getting phone calls and, on Facebook and, and on the phone. Uh, and people were mailing back pieces that they took over the years. So those pieces are actually back on the plane. The gauges that they took, uh, these two, four guys had a falling out. They built a cockpit with all the gauges. Uh, for it, and they, they had a falling out, and one guy called me and says, do you want to know where the gauges are? 
and why everybody's asking you how and why the ambulance let you in there. So he told me the story. He said, I got a couple of gauges. I just couldn't throw them away. So if you want them. So I drove out to Arizona, and I picked them up. He had uh, it was 12 gauges. Um, so the 12 gauges are actually back with the plane. I left them with Carl and Neil um, so they can store them. People give radios and everything, and I just take them, and I give them up to there. So the idea behind this one is the nose art, it does not have the 379th bomb group anymore because that was, somebody decided to put a tribute plane to the men and women, of, or to the men of the 379th bomb group. In 1959, when this plane arrived, it was a tribute to the men and women who served in World War II, 16 million. So now this little group came and made it a tribute to only 500 people. And this plane had n never saw combat in World War II. It was never assigned to a bomb group. Uh, Maurice Preston only flew it the one time. Uh, he was commander of 379 during World War II. And when they put the three, the all the markings on, when the 17's in the air, all the markings are supposed to be level. They put them level on the ground. And they had the zero for the obsolete with the 379th, which that wouldn't have worked. And then they had the US Air Force sticker. So we power washed it all off and um, received a lot of hate mail on Facebook. Uh, people telling me that we should move down to uh, the south and help them tear down statues because we're anti-American. Uh, it got to be really funny. Uh, so we, we took it all off and the history of this plane is it is actually the sole survivor of Operation Crossroads, 1946, which was the first atomic testing done after World War II. It was done at the Bikini Atoll off the Marshall Islands, and this was a mothership. So this ship would actually take off, pilot, co-pilot, the radio, and in the nose, instead of the Norton bomb site, it would actually have like a periscope and controls. A pilot would sit there and actually fly a B-17 drone in and around the atomic mushroom clouds. So this one actually has historical value. So when I went to the ambassador, I said, it needs to be historically accurate. We need to preserve our history because if we don't, nobody really cares. So we went and did that and uh, they showed up once in a blue moon and just walked away. And, but as soon as I took the sticker Preston's Pride off, when are you putting that back on? Uh, and, I, and I said, well, we talked, we're going historically accurate. This plane has historically, has value to the United States. It's not a plane that was built, went to storage, and making a tribute. I love tribute planes. I think they're really cool. Uh, Ye old Pub is it's nice to see uh, another all drab B-17 up in the air. They took the chin off, which was a, a G model. They took the chin off and made an F model to go with the movie or with the book, rather, a higher call. Nine or nine is a tribute plane. So we end up uh, doing this, and uh, so my contact comes out and says, you got to put that back on. I said, Tom, we talked. It's not historically right. I said, if I can find a photo of it in 1946, or even when it flew in that had Maurice Preston's name on it somewhere, I said, I will put that on there. Because that is part of its history, whether it was just a single flag. So he said, there's like, well, it has to be on. The commander wants it on. And then he goes and we're on this side and he looks at the nose. And he says, yeah, we got a crack up there. And I don't know how that crack got up there. And just start, and then walked away. I'm like, what the hell is that about? <laughs> So when I, and Carl, the one on the left, the shorter one, uh, he's an artist. I said, do you want to do the nose art? So he was all excited. I said, but you got to cover it every day so they don't see it. <laughs> so when we, that was the last thing we did. Everything else was painted. We did that. And just to cover myself, because I knew that they were going to be very upset because they wanted the sticker that they put on. That's the only reason they wanted it on there is because they did it. Uh, so I had it covered up and we had a ribbon cutting ceremony. I invited the mayor, uh, there was a senator there, a congressional representative there. Uh, so I invited all of them and plus the ambassador were there. Um, so when we finally revealed it, uh, the commander just looked at me and glared. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I knew I was safe because the TV cameras were there too, they weren't going to go and change it. <laughs> After I did the whole 45 minutes of historical value and this and that and this, uh, so I figured I was safe, but I figured they'd ask for their keys back. So we did that, and two of Maurice Preston's nephews were there. 
So the commander was right there, and I asked him, I said, all right, this plane will always be known as President's Pride. But it's historically accurate now. It doesn't matter what you call it. This is right. How would your uncle feel? He said, you did the exact thing that he would have wanted. It's not about an individual. It's about American history. So I knew that uh, our preservation was good. And after that, they didn't have to, I still have the keys. They haven't asked for them back. Um, plus, these, these guys and, and friends are taking care of it. They don't have to do anything. So this is uh, just for the crew that was there. And this was actually the day of the ribbon cutting ceremony for it. And she's still that shiny today. Um, and you can't see, but right behind here, the original 1938 or 39 hangar is there, uh, sitting vacant. And I talked with uh, one city official, and they're actually contemplating allowing us to put the B-17 inside. Leaving the hangar doors open so it's still visible 24 hours a day, still from the freeway, but it's not getting the direct sunlight. There's over a thousand rivets missing off the top. So when it rains, it just leaks. So we can't do the inside because if we do all the wood, it's gonna be rotted shortly. But if we can put it inside, we can preserve her so much longer. And they're willing to do that. And just because of what we started here, they're actually uh, figuring out how they can uh, lease the hangar for a dollar so that we can put it on the inside. Um, so we made progress. So the inside will be done uh, in February. We have photos while we're doing the episode of this one. We found the photos so we know what everything looks like. It doesn't have to be functional, but it just has to look like what it was. So when people walk in, not only on the outside, but the inside, they're walking into 1946 Operation Crossroads. And uh, it's, it's in the, the DVD, but Operation Crossroads was, took place on the Bikini Atoll. In 1946, a French designer, uh, made up a new bathing suit. He didn't know what to call it. And after the, all the, the testing was done, he named it the Bikini, after the Bikini Atoll. And his reasoning for it was, because it is small but powerful. <laughs> and so that's how the Bikini got his name, from an atomic bomb testing. <laughs> um, but this was absolutely an amazing project, because um, everybody says that we did this. I let pretty much the locals do all the work because it, it's their plan. It's been there since 1958. The only thing that we did is we struck a match and they kept the fire going. And to, to this day, they're still working on it. There's not a single weed anywhere under this plane. They sweep it all the time. Uh, they wash it and they take care of it like it should have been done way back when. Um, now, this was uh, our next project, down in Palm Springs. Um, that's Joe, that's Team Shine. He's the biggest character you'll ever meet. Um, when I first interviewed him, we did like an interview uh, for, for Preston's Pride. When, when we did the interview for this one, I simply said, this is Joe, everybody knows him. And he just took over because he's just a character. Uh, so we polished Miss Angela uh, and they said that they would never do another aluminum B-17 after doing Preston's Pride because it was just hard. Uh, but I just kept asking and asking. I invited him out there to do a test sample. He's like, oh, this isn't so hard. And then he went to his sponsors, and the sponsors kicked in. Uh, all the pads, these are cyclo pad, or polishers, all the buffing compounds, all the pads, all the rags, everything that they needed to do to polish this plane was donated. Uh, Palm Springs put them up in a hotel. Um, we, I got them lunch every day. They did their own breakfast. But uh, in a week, they polished Miss Angela. And when we first started, it was like, she looked good. If, you, if anybody's ever been out there, she looked really good. But when you polish a little bit, she looked horrible. Uh, she wasn't as shiny, but it was all the same way. So we did this one. And I had to get a picture of Eric. He's been on three projects that we've done together. He always does the underneath of the plane so he can sit in the chair. <laughs> Nobody else wants to do it because your arms are always over your head. He doesn't want to get on a wing. So he always takes the underneath of the plane. Um, and he, he's a great guy. He doesn't talk a lot, but uh, he just goes and gets it done. 
So when we finished, uh, she's, she's gorgeous. And when we first started, I thought the red, because Miss Angela's story, she was a fire tanker for 21 years, uh, fighting forest fires. She never saw combat. Uh, she spent uh, a little under three years with the uh, Caribbean Air Command. I was down in uh, Puerto Rico, Panama, and Bolivia. Uh, she was supposed to be a rescue boat, but was never fitted. She uh, was actually into a BB-17, so the radio room was actually a full galley and there were airline seats in her. So, and, and I always thought the red uh, was part of her original being a fire tanker, because she was three different, uh, four different tanker numbers. And I thought that was one of them until I was looking at a picture. This was actually painted on when we did the research in 1990, 1989 for the uh, 34th bomb group. So the red is the marking of the 34th and it has the yellow around the, the navigator nose or the bombardier nose. Um, that, those are all the markings of the 34th bomb group. Nobody knows why they painted 34th, uh, but they did. So, uh, the 100th Bomb Group has a mini reunion here. They're, they've been trying to get them to put a square D on the tail for, the, for there, which is fine, it's a tribute plane. Uh, but they were going to leave the red and just do it then. I'm like, we well, can't do two different Bomb Groups. If you're going to do it, you've got to do one. Uh, and Palm Springs Museum likes to do how Palm Springs Museum does it. They do it their own way. And uh, so whatever they do, but we polished her, uh, that, that only took a week, and that, that was actually a fun project. It was inside, uh, they had the air on, we kept the doors closed, and uh, again, they, they came out, Team China wasn't going to do it for there. Uh, and later on, I'll talk about Team China again. Now, every time we do a project, this is, the, the doors are open. Sunbelt Reynolds uh, is another company that is huge into veterans. Uh, they donated, on this particular job, there's a generator, a compressor, all the cords, uh, six scissor lifts, so that we could uh, reach everything and everybody had their own and just to be able to do it. So, Sunbelt Reynolds right here out of Riverside, uh, they donated for that, they donated here at the museum. We've had boom lifts, we've had auger bits, uh, whatever we need, it's a simple phone call and they work with our schedule. Uh, so they were up there and the tail was the very last section. The red, they're actually doing the red. That's why uh, the aluminum's covered there. But uh, yeah, some about Reynolds and Home Depot. Home Depot didn't help us on this one because there was no painting, it was all polishing. Uh, but some about Reynolds again stepped up and they helped us. They helped us up in Tulare. Uh, Home Depot was up there in Tulare as well. Uh, it was just a simple one day project, but some about up in, to Larry was about nine or $10,000 worth of equipment rental that they gave us. Um, they picked it up, they dropped it off, and even down here Riverside, uh, Visalia office that supplied up there only had one power washer, so um, Mike here at Riverside gave me his power washer to tow up there. And he's like, just bring it back when you're done. So I just hook it up and I go and I brought it back. So amazing company and what what they and the reason they're doing is for our veterans and then our, our next one uh, so Miss Angela is actually in editing by the end of July mid-July that one should be all done um, one thing I found on doing this and working with different museums uh, and, and the reason that I always come back here to March is because of the people uh, so our next episode is going to be out of Plains of Fame, uh, Piccadilly Lily 2. Now we painted uh, uh, Kismet on the side. When Wilbur was here, he moved back to uh, Virginia with his son. But they're putting that one back to flight. He'll never fly, in my opinion. There's just like way too much. And Plains of Fame works on single engine fighters, not four engine bombers. So it will sit there forever. So we didn't do anything with the plane there, but what we did is Home Depot um, came out again and Jeff gave us a Kwanzaa hut uh, frame to put out there. 
because they get a lot of veterans and out there it's, it gets hot, it's windy, it's raining, there, there's no place to get out any of the elements. So Home Depot donated all the sand, all the pavers, all the paint and everything for it. Uh, that's actually one of the Kwanzaa huts that came out here in the back lot, uh, March Field Air Museum. And in a day, Home Depot put it all together and we painted it. Uh, and here's the actual trailer bringing the pieces over. That's actually our trailer in front of it. Uh, there was another picture somewhere of a Kwanzaa hut, but we put the Kwanzaa hut together and Home Depot came and they sprayed it. We put the front end, back end. Home Depot actually even gave them a swamp cooler uh, just to keep it cool out there. So again, they were probably about another $20,000 between everything that they did to help us preserve history. Um, and and it, it was, again, coming back in March because you know, Jeff didn't have to give up a Kwanzaa hut for there, but it, it's preserving history. Uh, so that was, that's why I keep coming back here, because the people are nice. <laughs> um, so this was, uh, this was a real quick project, only because it was a Kwanzaa hut. I mean, Home Depot had all the pavers and the sand done by noon, and they were out of there by 2 o'clock, and then it was just spraying. And let the paint dry, come back another day, and spray, uh, spray put the wood on for there. Um, this one will probably be released in September. Again, nothing we can do to the plane because they're going to make it fly. Um, so when they're going to make it fly, we can't, we can't do anything to that. We're not a But we were able to improve the display of the B-17. And it's not a Kwanzaa hut because it was in Europe. It's a Nissan hut. People made sure that they told me that as well. So it's really funny is you have to be accurate when you're going to tell history. So now when I post, I either say, I say Nissan Hut, Kwanzaa Hut, um, just because if I say just Nissan Hut, people say no, it's a Kwanzaa Hut because the ribs go this way. It's, yeah, it's fun. Um, sentimental journey, not a whole lot we can do to this one because it flies. We can't touch it. Uh, we can probably polish it, but they have their own volunteers that come and polish it. Um, this episode, um, What's that? It's a Betty Grable. Yeah. And this photo of Betty Grable, they had to actually get the rights from the estate to be able to use this photo. And she was pregnant in this photo. That's why her back is to us. Um, beautiful plane. Uh, still flies. Flies a lot. Uh, but again, nothing to do. Lions Museum. Uh, this one was fun because uh, we actually interviewed a lot of veterans out here a couple years ago. Uh, so then I said, hey, we went to the staff, and can we uh, film the plane? We need like four hours. What we don't do, we can do green screen, but we need to never get a phone call back. But as soon as uh, uh, Preston's Pride was done and Miss Angela was all done, all of a sudden uh, I saw him out of Planes of Fame, and uh, he's like, Craig, how you doing? <laughs> I forget where we left it. Uh, when are you going to do our plane? When are you going to film ours? And I didn't want to say, you never call me that. I said, well, I think we left it to late summer. OK, just let me know. We're ready to go. So it was kind of funny. I thought that, would, that one would never be done. And then, but uh, again, nothing we can do on this one other than film it. We already have the interviews of all the veterans in front of all their positions of the plane. Beautiful plane. Uh, it, it's airworthy, but it needs inspections. The reason it's grounded is because it went over its hours. Uh, or no, excuse me, went over its years, not hours. Mm -hmm. They're trying to get it to change hours, not years, for, for the FAA inspection. So the only reason it's grounded is because it went over years, because it, it only flies, I think, less than 100 hours a year. So they don't tour, they just go to air shows locally and do that. Same with Miss Angela. It's airworthy, such as this one. And somebody corrected me and said, no, it's flyable. <laughs> so it's airworthy with inspections and you know, hoses, and it's got to be checked out. But uh, this won't be done. Again, I'll, it's a real quick shoot to tell its story. Its big story is it was uh, in a couple movies. Oh, and Sentimental Journey was actually um, 
in Operation Greenhouse, which is the atomic testing in 1951, where the first normal, uh, thermal nuclear bomb was detonated. Uh, but on here they have, you know, it was in a couple movies, it was in a stupid commercial. Uh, so they have insignias on there, but they have nothing for the atomic uh, to display that it was in there in 1951. So I'm trying to find one, but I can't find anything on Operation Greenhouse. So it will come up, hopefully by the time we get to that episode, so we can stick a sticker on there. And because that's part of its history. Other than that, she was a tanker uh, for a number of years. She was tanker number 17. And we're actually interviewing in a couple weeks uh, the pilot who flew this one the most. Uh, Bill Waldman, he's out of uh, New Mexico, and he's a character. Uh, he was a character back in the 70s when he was flying, so I figured it's got to be even better take because the older we get, we lose our filters. <laughs> so I'm thinking it's, it's going to be pretty entertaining on that one. Um, Virgin's Delight, this is the, the end of summer. Again, it's a tribute plane. Now, this one was a fire tanker uh, with TPM out of uh, Sequoia Field in, in Tulare. And once it was getting towards the end and they were getting rid of the B-17s out of the tanker, they donated it to the museum. Now, the museum was still owned by the Air Force at the time, so they just gave it right back to the Air Force. Even though it has an end number, it is still owned by National Museum of the U.S. Air Force. Um, this one's a fairly simple preservation job. There's a tree in the back that the stabilizer is just peeled. The sap went on the plane, and it's been, since 1980, it was painted. So the paint is just there. So again, we're going to use Rust-Oleum paint because it's almost the same color yellow and it lasts very good and we'll just redo the yellow on the, uh, the horizontal as well as the vertical. And then there's the wingtips are also yellow on that one. Now when I went to Tony, because we do everything historically accurate, if we're, if we're going to preserve history, we got to preserve history. Now Virgin's Delight originally had a girl with one breast shot. Kind of not even a very good drawing. So uh, but a little better in stick figures, though. So I went to Tony, and I'm like, man, this is going to be a battle. because." So I had this all planned out, how I'm going to negotiate with him to get the original nose art back on. Because Virgin Delight would have been painted up higher, above the windows, and the girl would have been where, where the wording is. So went up to Tony, and uh, he really good. I get to play in all the planes when I go up there. And I said, so we're going to redo the yellow as soon as it cools down because the paint can't be too, too warm. I said, but Tony, I want to put the original nose art back on. He's like, all right. I'm like, with the girl. Okay. I'm like, that's it? He's like, it's my plane. It's his story. It's accurate. Do it. I'm like, perfect. So Carl, who did the nose art, is all excited. He's going to get to do another nose art up there. And Carl and Neil actually come up here every other weekend and watch this one too. It's about an hour and 25 minute drive north from Tulare. Uh, so, and it, it's going preservation. It, it will never fly. It's owned by the Air Force. Whether it can start the flight, it never will. But it is a tribute plane to General Cal or uh, yeah, General Castle. So, it should be accurate. Uh, and. Everybody says, well, you know, people are going to walk in and, and see uh, you know, a breasted girl. I'm like, you go to any art museum, they're everywhere. <laughs> this is historically accurate to the point. It wasn't anything sexual. This was what it was. And if you don't like it, just don't look at it. Um, and Tony's like, they can just, I'll give them a refund. They can just leave my museum. <laughs> so I'm like, I like that. Um, so that's all we're doing is just the yellow on this one. We'll redo the black, uh, or we may just get rid of the black, because that would have been a de-icer, and they didn't have those in there, because if it was shot, then it's just flap, and it, it doesn't help with the it, steering of the plane, any controls. So we'll probably just get rid of the black altogether. We'll redo the numbers. They're actually just vinyl stickers, so we'll actually paint them on there. So this is probably a two-weekend job. One weekend to get it all wet and remove everything and scuff everything up and do a coat. And then we can come back second weekend and we can do the black. So it, it's a fairly easy one. Um, now, I love B-17s. Uh, I think it's the coolest plane. Jeff says this one is because this one won the war. Uh, but 
So we get a lot of people saying, when are you going to do some of the other plans? Uh, and since I'm paying my camera guy to come up and film the 17 when we're up there, there's a B-29 sitting right here, right next to it is a B-50, and right over here is a B-24. I thought, why don't we preserve the history of all these planes? At least tell their stories. So as long as we're up there, we'll film everything we can, and then we can just go and put them all together. Because, I mean, it's, it's a beautiful B-29. Uh, the B-24, this was actually, there's two serial numbers on the front and on the back. It was two sections of plane. They, they just made one plane for it. But it can be a tribute plane. Pick something that is uh, you know, a good scheme, good markings, something associated with maybe General Castle or something. Pick something. And instead of having two seconds, let's just make it one plane. And let's preserve the history of the B-24s. Uh, almost 18,000 were built. There are fewer than nine complete B-24s left in the world. Uh, total of 13 that could totally be together. They're just parts here and there. The B-29, there are almost 4,000 built. There's less than 20 left. The B-25, there so were 300 built, and there's less than five or six left. So. If we don't preserve history and preserve the stories and preserve the planes to the men who flew them, the men who built them, the women who built them and, and transported them, then we're, we're just not doing justice to all of our veterans. And then also, you know, uh, this is our B-25 here, so you have to include the B-25 as well. And then the other one, well, there's a B-26 somewhere in here. But, uh, so if we did all the, I'm thinking of doing all the World War II radials. Because that's when men flew airplanes. Uh, they got in there, they muscled them on, they, they did it. Kids flew airplanes, if I rephrase, kids flew airplanes. Today, airplanes fly the men. They're there just to put landing gear down, but for the most part, uh, the planes fly themselves. This is when they were flying them. And you have to imagine that, that the kids that were in this came from the farmland, all of a sudden flew an airplane. They never saw the ocean. And all of a sudden they're in the 17, they're up at 30,000 feet, uh, negative 60 degrees, getting shot at. <coughs> so we have to preserve not only the aircraft, and I got some slides over there, but we have to preserve the memory of the men who, who flew them. And I put this photo in here because, like I said, Jeff gave uh, uh, Plains of Fame a Kwanzaa hut. So I'm, my dad lives, I don't know, an hour or so past here. I'm at, and Alex and I was out there, he's like, hey, there's some T-28 pieces out there. Road trip. I'm like, all right, where am I going? So as I'm going, and the road's getting smaller, I'm in the middle of nowhere, I come across this town, this goat town. It was the the most productive gold town in southern Nevada, uh, El Dorado. Uh, so I went out there, I, I took my dog, and they had a T-28 that was used in a movie and some props and stuff. But then you go down and there's like 28 T-28s behind a fence. Um, and then as I'm going, there's all sorts of military vehicles down there. So then I go back and I talk to uh, the owners here, Tony and, and Bobby. And uh, they very gracious, very nice people. We actually had a road trip uh, about a week ago and came back with T-28 parts. The guy just gave them to us. Uh, they were just sitting in his shed or buildings or boxes, wherever they were, and he has an engine. He's going to give us an engine. Uh, there's a Gamma Goat, which is a Vietnam six-wheel little thingy. Uh, he said we can have that. There's a World War II deuce and a half. He says, it's just in here. Why don't you take it? So simply by Alex seeing an airplane on Google Earth, uh, we end up getting most of the parts that we need to put our T-28 back together. So, uh, so I had to put a photo because it's not only um, museums preserving history, ghost towns are preserving history. How T-28s ever got into a ghost town? It's nothing to do with the 1800s. Um, but the people were so nice. Um, whatever we ask that we can get for ours, they, they graciously helped us load it up. So we have another trip because 
we got some heavy stuff to go. But simply, they are preserving the history of the gold rush, of the gold town. It's an amazing place. They got stuff everywhere. Um, and they help us preserve the history of airplanes. And some of, I put these up there because without a lot of our sponsors, we couldn't do anything. Interstate Batteries gives us batteries whenever we need anything uh, for it. Um, this is my cousin. This is Murphy sandblasting. He had to do the whole Top Gun thing. Uh, you put grown men around airplanes and they become children. Uh, so he came out and he sandblasted our cleat track for us. Um, so then I'm like, come on, you want to go get your truck by some airplanes? So, so he was having some fun. Procast did some stuff for us. Again, Sunbelt uh, gives us whatever we need for anything. So this is my cousin sandblasting the cleat track, getting all that yellow off, the cat yellow. And Alex has already primered it. This is already OD green. He's working on a lot of the other parts. So as soon as it's back together, it was running. Uh, now it can run again. But it'll be <clears throat> all a drab. Uh, and this is how it sat uh, about a week ago. So it is all painted, and the trailer back here is full of all the parts that we took off uh, for it. They've all been sandblasted, they're primer, they're just waiting to be painted, and then put right back on there. Uh, now the cleat track came from uh, the vintage steam and gas engine down there in Vista. Um, Don said, hey, there, there's a cleat track down there. I don't think they know what they have because it's painted yellow. So my son and I went down there. It was just sitting there. So we took photos, and I, I talked with uh, the curator there, Ashley. I said, it's military. You want to just uh, give it to March because, you know, they could use it. And she said, hey, we got a searchlight out there, too. You want to look at it? Well, yeah. <laughs> so it was all gray. Uh, Alex Power washed it, and then Les and everybody, they painted it up back all in drab. Uh, but it's just another part of preservation. It would have sat down there. The glass is still in there. It would have sat there and got broken or eventually just put in for recycled metal weight. So it's here. It's preserved. And you know, who knows what this light was ever shown upon during World War II. Um, and this is the T-28, sort of. Um, so we were able to get a lot of pieces. We got duplicates, but we did get the pieces that we needed. Uh, we got the main canopy. The, the top canopy that still has a black on it, that actually came from Castle. When I went up and saw Tony, uh, it, it was arranged that they had the T-28 center canopy, so he gave that to us for it, as well as the engine mount that's sitting right in front there. So it, it's nice to see, coming from my side, it's nice to see museums helping other museums preserve history. They could have kept that, they could have sold that. Uh, I mean, it's a brand new canopy, and that's the factory coating on it. But in fact, they just gave it to help other museums. They don't have a T-28, they never plan to have one. So they helped us preserve history for ours. This was a fun one too, a World War II forklift. Again, Alex uh, found it and then uh, went out there and I met the gentleman. And he had all this crazy cool stuff around his property. So Jeff, Alex, and I went out. We loaded it up. And um, the guy was gracious to show us everything. Now, they, he also has uh, some property up near Palmdale. And our air raid siren, the engine's bad. He says he may have an engine that he'll give us. So simply by looking at a forklift on, and he gave it to us, and a simple one, road trip, we can put this back, whether we ever do anything with it, maybe there's some other place that could use a World War II forklift. But it's preserved. It's not going to the scrap for metal. Um, and this is this is taken at the last air show. I think this is a cool picture. My picture, by the way. Um, we are sitting there talking, and I just heard a whisper, and I had my phone in my hand, and I looked up, I'm like, holy crap. And I just clicked it. And this is a, an example of 10 men flying an airplane and a B-2 flying the airman. I mean, at over 10,000 adjustments per second. Um, and it's just from, from what it was to what it is. 
Um, just kind of a fun photo. Now, it's not always about aircraft. It's about preserving the memories and what our, our servicemen of all branches did for our country. Not only World War II, but whoever put a uniform on, whether it was in peacetime or not. Uh, the gentleman in the center with the yellow hat is Colonel Earl Williams. He was, a, he was the one who's actually stationed here April 40 through August of 41 and flew into Pearl on a B-17. Now, I, I learned about six months ago that he actually, uh, when he was on that flight into Pearl, he was only a mechanic because they were island hopping. So if somebody needed to turn a wrench, he was going to turn it. After they were shot down over Pearl, he spent four hours on a 50 caliber and they made him a tail gunner. So he flew uh, 15 missions at his tail gunner before he went to the top turret flight engineer. Um, they never changed his service record. He was always a mechanic. He never received any combat pay for 55 missions a year in the South Pacific. Uh, and I, I just found out that his birthday is March 10th. Uh, about a couple days before we were having lunch and he was just telling me. Uh, and we're fighting to get his purple hat, or his purple heart, excuse me. So, the reason I dress very casual today is because I had shirts done. Uh, it's this shirt with Earl's birthday, and it just has first plane shot down, 55 missions, 30 years of service. Uh, so I have one for everybody. I hope I, I have enough in the right sizes, because I'm trying to get his purple heart, and I hit a wall. So the reason for the shirts are, Somebody will wear it, somebody will see it, and that one person could be the one who can get me over that wall, and I can continue my quest to get him his Purple Heart. He's 100 years old, he just bought a brand new car. Um, he just renewed his driver's license. He just had a water leak in his house, so his house is, he's living in a hotel now, while the fans are blowing dry and everything. And he goes there every day to watch the carpenters, he said, because they're gonna try to screw me and not, his house is plaster, they brought drywall. He says, that's plaster, I don't want drywall. Well, this will work. My house is plaster. <laughs> Take that stuff and go. <laughs> so, he's a character, does not use a cane, does not use a walker, sharp as a tag. Um, so, his family, this is his family on this side. This is his daughter, his granddaughter, his grandniece, his niece, or his nephew, grand uh, nephew. That one I don't know. And that's Ian, he's with Palm Springs Air Museum and then pretty much uh, Air Museum and us over on this side. And this lady's son, who's actually taking a picture, drew that for him. And it's actually the same photo that's on the shirt. So he used the shirt to copy the plane and he drew it by pencil and gave it to him. He drew that in a week and gave it to him on a, when uh, we invited him out here. And she made his birthday cake for his 100th birthday when we had the family dinner at, at the museum or at the Hap Arnold. Um, but he took a ride in the T-6. He's supposed to go in a P-51. So he climbs in, he gets, goes up on the wing, gets in, and is taxiing out. If you go to Palm Springs, you go out the gate, then you go down about a quarter mile, then you hit the runway, and then you can go. Uh, one of the magnetos was, was missing. So it's sputtering down there, and it comes back sputtering. Uh, so he pulls in, and Earl climbs out, gets on the wing, slides off, walks over to me, and says, that son of a gun plane broke. When do I get my freaking ride? <laughs> um, and Tom Nightingale, who's the pilot, this is his personal plane, says, uh, I'll take him up in my plane. I was like, well, it's not a P-51, but OK. <laughs> so he went up for a ride on the plane. And um, uh, at least his family was out here. They all live in Texas and the East Coast. But by doing the shirts, it's making people aware. Now, I'm down to, I maybe, hopefully, I think the last piece that they need, because I sent an entire package, they didn't read any of the package. They came back and said, uh, there's no paper from Pearl Harbor or from medical showing that he was wounded. And my reply was, well, you also sent me uh, documentation that you didn't keep records in the morning. So how, I know there won't be one. Well, then we need a witness. I said, well, that's attachment five. Uh, his pilot at the time, Second Lieutenant Reed, uh, took him to the hospital. So he wrote a letter. Uh, Earl was wounded while in the air while we were being attacked by a Japanese Zero, and I took him to the hospital. And they're like, we don't have that. I says attachment five. So they, I've been fighting them for three years. 
So uh, I decide I'm going to write in crayon, real, real big letters, and I'll send it to them. Just attachment five. So that should be the last thing. Uh, Congress was helping or had congressional help. All they did is send my emails. They didn't do a dang thing. So I figure I'll just go and continue this. But I will get him his Purple Heart because it is documented. His plane is the famous plane that sits on any image of Pearl Harbor. Uh, B-17C model that was uh, uh, burnt in half. It came down in a ball of flame as soon as the wheels touched, but within seconds the plane fell apart. Um, on the 12 B-17s that flew into Pearl that day, there were 11 Purple Hearts awarded. There were six planes by the 38th Reconnaissance and six planes by the 88th Reconnaissance, uh, planes that made up the 12 planes. Two of the medals were on the 88th Reconnaissance B-17, and then another two were on another 38th, but seven of the airmen on Earl's plane received the Purple Heart. Uh, all officers received the Purple Heart. So, um, yeah, so it's, it's been a challenge. He's 100 years old because his, this is Judy, this is his wife, this is his second wife. His first wife, uh, Lorraine, passed after 46 years of marriage of cancer. Uh, Judy has early stages of Alzheimer's, so if it is a posthumously awarded medal, it doesn't mean anything to her because she wasn't there at the time. She was much after. Plus, with the Alzheimer's, it doesn't mean anything to her. It only means something to Earl uh, that it's, it's not the medal, it's the recognition that he was wounded. And it has nothing to do with the metal because he's been saying, I was grazed in the head. I look with the black light, I can see a line. Did I want to see a line? I was hopeful to see a line, um, but there's definitely something there. So it's preserving the history of our men and women who served. Um, this is, Earl's right here in the center. This is March 17th, um, NASCAR approached me. Uh, because they saw stuff on Facebook that uh, Colonel Williams was turning 100. So they honored him at NASCAR. So this is the actual driver's meeting. So uh, uh, Motley Crue was there, Jennifer Aniston, Jay Leno, a whole bunch of actors and uh, fighters and all this. So when they were introducing uh, Motley Crue, everybody's like, yay, a couple, you know, 10, 20 seconds of clapping, Jennifer Aniston, Jay Leno. When they uh, mentioned Earl, it was a five minute standing ovation. So it, it was neat to see that the veterans got the attention, not the actors who do get paid a crazy amount of money for having fun. So this is there. Uh, it was a standing ovation, and uh, he was actually touched. We had a personal um, escort to take us through. Um, I think there was another. Uh, but Earl was actually in the pace car uh, for NASCAR. So they're like, would he want to do it? I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> he wants to do it. So he was in the pace car uh, for NASCAR. He did his couple laps. Um, and they, I talked to him like a couple days before, the Friday before the race. And I'm like, ooh, I don't know if we can do it. I'm like, man, it'd be really cool if you could. So when we get there Sunday, they're like, he's got a spot if he wants it. Um, so we had a police escort all the way into the whole racetrack from Ontario Airport, running lights, and people were like looking because who is this? Who is this? It was just a fun day. Um, but again, it was neat to see that they respected the veteran more than the actors uh, for it. This, I, I added this photo because I think this is important because uh, we have one youngster here because when we go and we preserve history, we go, we can talk to five people as adults. But when we get the, the young kids, they talk to hundreds a day. So if they can go, and then this girl came out and did an interview with Earl for a school project, and she had all her questions, and uh, knowing that he was in Australia before the U.S. forces came, uh, they wore Australian uniforms, they ate with the Australians, they lived with the Australians, so all her questions were about, uh, how'd you like mutton? <laughs> uh, and it was just different questions that have never, he's never asked, he's like, he leans over to me and says, nobody's ever asked me this. <laughs> so our, our younger generations are the ones that we have to expose them to our history. 
because they go to school, they see hundreds of people a day, we only see a handful a day, and they will go on Google or whatever, and they'll learn more about it. She came to his 100th birthday just to tell him that she did very good on the paper and to thank him. Uh, and he, uh, when we got home, he, he had me get her address and he sent his little story on Pearl, just in case she missed something and she, she wanted to be accurate. Um, this is Sentimental Journey. When uh, we went up, we did some filming and Earl, uh, actually they had him sign the Bombay door for it. So this was actually going to be episode four, but I've been moving it back while I fight with the Purple Heart because Sentimental Journey would be a great title to put Earl's story finally getting his Purple Heart. So I have enough, I can keep bumping it until we do that. Hopefully I don't have to keep bumping too long. Um, but yeah, so when I said, hey, let's go for a ride in the B-17 so we can do some filming, he's like, again? You know how many times I've been up in those? And I'm like, you know, people pay a lot of money to ride these and they would die to get a free ride? Well, how about give me in that P-51 if you want to give me a ride? So he's, he's, he's a great guy, he's honoring. And this is a part about preserving history. If you're going to tell history, you've got to preserve history, you got to do it right. So the title of this one, Most Dangerous Job During World War II, a B-17 bomber. And this was actually on Facebook. I took off the person who attached it because he's an author, and I, I just thought it was kind of funny. Now, this B-17 here, uh, this is actually white, and this is a red strip, 84E. Um, this is a tanker. Now, there's got to be enough photos of B-17s from World War II that you can put any photo of a B-17 from World War II. Down here is the actual retardant Bombay here. So this is the tanker now. If they want, they could use the same exact plane. All they had to do is use this picture. That's the same plane. But they use the tanker image. So I just find it really funny that you can't seriously look at that and say, there's not a single gun on there. How can it be dangerous? Well, yeah. You're big white, no guns. You're definitely going to be a target. <laughs> um, another thing about preserving history, this book came out. I haven't read the book yet. I have a lot of B-17 books. Uh, Heroes who flew the B-17 in World War II. So this is the cover, and I reached out to the author because it was on Facebook. Everybody was just bashing him, bashing him, bashing him. Because if you look at the airplane, uh, if you look at the bombs, those are not World War II bombs. And if you look at the airplane, this is actually one of the motherships during Operation Crossroads. Uh, and it didn't never even open its bomb base. There's no top turret, there's no, it's a, it's a radar cameras on the bottom, there's no top turret. This plane was in Operation Crossroads, never saw service during World War II. So I thought, let me give the author, Travis, a chance to say, why'd you use that one? Uh, he's never responded, I contacted the publishing company just to see. But this publishing company does not give the author's approval for the cover. The cover is all done by the publishing company. So the author had no say in what was going to be on his cover. He just did the words on the inside. Um, but still, your name's on the book. Yeah. If you're going to preserve history, preserve history. Uh, talk about the atomic bombs if you want to, the testing at the, in the South Pacific. Um, but you have to at least do the photo. Part of preserving history that, that we do, in my garage I have relics to over 119 different B-17 crashes from all over the world. Uh, I have archaeologists who go out in Europe and this is what they do, they get up and they uh, do all the research and say, hey, this is from such and such plane, if you pay the shipping I'll send you all the pieces. I'm like, perfect. So I was on Facebook and Cheryl reached out and I was asking a question about a particular plane because I had two names, but different serial numbers. There was a digit was, was transposed. And she says, why are you inquiring about my dad's plane? I said, oh, was it whatever the serial number was? And it went down on this date, and she's like, yeah. I said, oh, okay, I have pieces to the plane. Do you have pieces to your dad's plane? She says, no. So I made three shadow boxes, because she has two sisters. So uh, they live in Cucamonga. 
So they actually came out here. Uh, that's Starduster in the background. And I actually uh, gave them uh, uh, the three pieces of the plane. So now they have a piece of their, their dad's plane. And then about two weeks, about two months later, um, Rick came out and said, hey, there's somebody who's asking about you. Her other sister came out for a visit and wanted to thank me. Um, so for that family, we preserved the history, the memory of her dad. And then final shot for it, um, World War II veterans, every veteran is, is, is important, is special. World War II veterans is the greatest generation. Every time we lose a World War II veteran, we lose a, a library closes its doors forever. You have to remember that World War II veterans um, probably grew up and they didn't have indoor plumbing, didn't have telephones, or you went to the general store and you had to stand at the wall and crank the phone and Mabel would connect you to somebody else. Um, cars didn't have roll-up windows. They were wood frames. Um, technology, when they grew up, they were fabric airplanes, or wood airplanes covered with fabric and you crawled on them to get in. Maybe two guys to going to a four-engine metal airplane that 10 guys crawled in and went up 30,000 feet uh, to <coughs> phones, to rotary phones in every house, to driving down the freeway at 80 miles an hour and your car does the dialing, indoor plumbing, the spaceship, the, you know, the SR-71, just the advances in technology will never be seen again by any other generation because it happens so fast these days. We don't know that it's already changing, but before we started, technology already changed before we all walked in here. This was the time that the changes were slow and these guys saw everything. Lived through the Great Depression. Eight, maybe didn't. Uh, lived multiple families. Uh, even uh, their, their parents lost in uh, you know, all the diseases of the early uh, the typhoid fever. So I encourage any young ones, talk to your grandpa, a, a veteran, uh, anything. When you see a veteran with a hat, thank them. Um, it's simple, you're walking by anyways, all you have to do is look them in the eye and say thank you. Because if it wasn't for the men and women who flew, who built, who maintained this plane and every other single piece of equipment that we had in World War II, we wouldn't be here today. Um, so I, I'm, the best part about my job is I get to meet all these amazing World War II veterans. I hear their stories. I used to do uh, house remodels, and I can work 12 hours a day. I sit with three hours with a veteran. I go home and I curl up on my couch and take a nap. It's just exhausting. It's mentally draining because they're reliving and I'm reliving their story with them. And you can see the emotion in their face or you watch their hands as they tighten during a bad part of a story or when they lost their airmen. Um, so yeah, it, that's the most amazing part about what I do. The worst part is I meet these amazing World War II veterans and our friendships are very short because they're in their mid to high 90s. Um, so I try to interview them. When we interview a veteran for, for any of ours, it's, we don't just go get the interview, they become part of our family. So we, we attend funerals, birthday parties. Uh, we have a 99 year old coming up in October in Hemet. Um, excellent shape, um, but we get invited to go have apple pie with the family. The families invite us everywhere. And it, it's not just the interview, it's becoming part of the family. The funeral I just attended uh, for Keith Sprague um, up in Tulare. Uh, just some email exchanges back and forth with a granddaughter up in, o or in Oregon. Uh, she came up just sobbing and crying. Uh, so, you know, don't talk about this stuff because I get emotional. But, but it's, it, it, when I go to bed, I know what I've done and what we're doing is the right thing preserving history. So, uh, if anybody has any questions about any of it, I'd be more than happy. And young man, thank you for coming. Um, you got Google, you can check out all this stuff. Uh, and you can find out more than we can because you can do it a whole lot faster. Uh, but if, you have, if your grandpa's still with us or uncles or anybody, listen to their stories because soon you won't be able to. 
Thank you very much. Thank you.